lads. So then, boys, let me get his hat off off the trunk. So then, boys, we have a very interesting car on the channel today. We have a Mark 1 Focus RS, which Liam has lent us for a couple of hours. Now, I've driven a Mark 2 Focus RS, the first ever review. Now, I'm intrigued to see how these, you know, relate to the Mark 2. They are somewhat similar. You know, they're both front-wheel drive. Obviously, the Mark 2's got a 5 pot. This has got a 4 pot. But, you know, considering weight to power and things like that, they're pretty similar. Now, compared to the Mark II, these are a little bit of a more collector's item. They are becoming rarer and rarer and rarer. They only made 4,000 of these, just over 4,000, and they only did them in the one colour, which is called Imperial Blue, which is like a gorgeous deep blue. Now, it has got different wheels on, they are, they are not the standard wheels, but bodywork is pretty standard. Seats are completely standard, which are, for the time, gorgeous, obviously from from Sparko, which takes us back a little bit, as you know, Sparko was the the things in the early 2000s and stuff. Now it's points was a little bit more Recaro, but for the A's, these are amazing. They've got Alcantara in the middle, and they've got these blue stripes to go with the rest of the interior. You know, because this color was the RS blue. You've got a blue car. You've got a blue steering wheel. You've got blue seats. You've got blue door cards. Blue clocks. Obviously, the blue RS badge. Now the only thing that's not come blue with the car is. The floor mats, these are actually the standard floor mats which come with the car, uh, and they're actually not blue. I thought they would have blue stitching, but they've actually got black stitching, which is, you know, a little bit different than what you'd think. Now, moving on from that point, uh, Liam's got this recently. Uh, he's bought it. He's not had it too long. He's bought it like this, but the original owner uh, wants it to keep it as, as, as original as possible, so they've got the original floor mats from the car as standard. Now, these cars actually come with a pen. It's still there with its little holder as well. Absolutely amazing. And as well, to get, going with the theme, it's actually got the standard radio inside of it, which, you know, for a car owner, especially like Liam, who's near the same age as me, it's, that's pretty brave. I mean, I would not be able to have a car nowadays without USB, without aux, things like that. But the other thing that's, that's, that's a little bit weird is that he has a microphone up here. Now, I don't know where that microphone goes, because it clearly does not go to that head unit. So the only thing which things which aren't standard inside the car really from what i can tell anyway uh are these um aircon controllers whatever buttons whatever you know call them uh, these gauges are not standard you've got an oil temperature gauge and a water temperature gauge they're not standard but they tie in with the interior really well with the, with the blue wrap behind them uh, but they actually do have a turbo gauge as standard in bar Boom. the things that intrigue me about this car is that you know when you look at it side on from the rear quarter it doesn't look like much anything different than a standard focus until you come to the side and you see the huge rear arches but then it's kind of like they said well no it still kind of looks like a focus guys you know we want it to look like something and then boom they kind of change the whole front end and the front end is just gorgeous it's so wide it's so low it's so wide it's just it, the front end just properly ties this car off they even got the xenons back in 2002 absolutely mental and obviously the cheeky rs owners club badge such a show that you take pride in it now you must be thinking lee that's all well and good you know it's very pretty it's all tied together yeah someone's took care of it what are the annoying points the annoying points i'll get on to them now they have this silly silly design to open the bonnet where you have to flick that then you have to go left and then right, and then pull it. Well, you need two arms, left and right, get a finger on it. Nope, I need two arms. Why is that annoying, do you say? Because, you know, for a lot of people who did not know that, you would never ever be able to open the bonnet. And also, this, the amount of times I've seen where people snap the key in these because they come uh, thingy over time, they become rusty and become solid, and you've got to be really careful with them because the mechanism, you know, it doesn't feel that sturdy in a way. So, I'm not a huge fan of that. I've seen it a lot of times where people have had to drill them out and use a big flat screwdriver, push it through, and then, and you know, it's just not a very clever design. And they still took that over to the Mark II, which I'm very, very, very surprised about. And the other annoying thing, which I just think is unnecessary, I just feel like this is just something where they've tried to make it look more futuristic than it actually is and to turn the car on okay you have a key which you have to tuck in you have to turn the ignition on but then you have to come down here and press a button i just i just don't understand if you have to go through that process 
why put a button in? It's just, it's. I just think that's silly. Just keep it as a key, or just do a button altogether. Although I hate keyless. Actually, never put buttons in. I think buttons are rubbish. It's easy to go wrong. More electronics. We don't want that. Every manufacturer should just have a key, as it should be. Now, the lovely little quirk is the button there of which number this is. I'm guessing that is it. Uh, well, I, I know that they do have them printed inside the car, and that's the only number within 4,000 on the car. So I'm guessing that this is number 2,435. Now, the most unusual thing about this car is something that I felt on the way driving to this spot, which took me about 20 minutes just to find a spot. I don't know what it does, but I felt it, and I don't have a clue what it does. It is under the driver's seat, okay? You actually have... A lever which goes back and forward lovely but then you actually have a turn knob here oh it actually raises the seat <laughs> a bit like a window to turn the seat now you know that's very quirky and all so we're just gonna turn the turn knob and we're slowly gonna rise up now I don't understand why you would want to rise up because these cars the seats are stupidly high anyway. I'm on the highest setting and my head's nearly touching the roof, okay? So let's go to the lowest setting and I'm about two inches from the roof. But you can see, I this is the highest setting now. Lowest setting, I'm way above the steering wheel and, you know, my head is basically touching the window. So this is how a Mark 1 RS owner would look like sitting, driving a Mark 1 RS. Now, I don't know what it looks like from your angle, from my angle, it feels like people are going to look at me and think, fucking hell, he sits high, doesn't he? But the thing I do love about this is it's all very simplistic. It, you know, every button is very easy to tell what it does, you know. There's no having to, what does this do? What does that do? There's hardly any buttons in here whatsoever. And every button is clearly labelled. I've not had any issue, you know, finding anything that I would need to know there's none of this getting in the car and wondering what the hell anything does you just get in turn it with that silly start button and then just drive now the car takes that simplistic feel even further when you go into the engine bay and it clearly labels everything that you might need to know oh what's that oh it's the intercooler wait what car am i in oh oh it's a focus wait what 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 engine's this oh it's a duratec Oh, and it's actually an RS. You know, everything's just very simple. Everything's just very, this is who I am. This is who I am. Now, the car is put, the car is not standard power. These cars come out of the factory around about 212 brake horsepower. You know, not 60, just over six seconds. So there's a little bit of an argument about this. You know, there still is this argument of, you know, it, should it be four-wheel drive? It's released when the Evos and the Subarus were all doing four-wheel drive and things like this. But then, obviously, some people argue that the car was 10 years ahead of its time in relation to track monsters. You know, all the track monsters nowadays are front-wheel drive, front, -wheel, front engine, front-wheel drive. You know, the Megans, the Civics. You know, so a lot of people will just say, a lot of people will say that, you know, they should have gone four-wheel drive, they should have gone with the competition. But then a lot of people were saying no. They knew what they were doing. They were putting front-wheel drive car because, you know, all the track monsters and, you know, the better handling cars are front engine front wheel drive but this car is 300 brake horsepower running around 300 brake horsepower putting up from v whining and going about the little features and quirks of this car which i'm joking i'm not whining i actually love doing that and i'm probably sure you do but let's go and drive this 300 brake horsepower mark one focus rs greeted with the now and ours. Mind all my stuff over there, that is just my camera recording equipment Anto, GoPro, etc. But you see, lads, I thought I lost the key then. It's in the ignition. Ignition on, come down here. I don't and start the car. I definitely do feel high in the car as well, but a lot of Fords do that. I felt like that was pretty much the same in the in the Mark II as well. But the steering wheel is, I, I, I actually love it. Although it's really old, and you can tell it's old and it looks old, it, it, it's small, it's nimble, it, it's, it's not too heavy. And that just translates to the steering in general. The steering is just for its age, it is so responsive. Like it's so tight and sharp. There's not much play in the steering rack. Torque steer, so the, the torque steer is there, and it's 
you know, not overwhelming like the Mazda where you feel like it is going to kill you, but it's just, you know, it just it gives you a little bit of fight. Whoa! <laughs> just enough fight to make it interesting.
So what an amazing car. I was pleasantly surprised by it. I didn't think it would be as good as it was. I've drove a lot of cars of its age and you know, you can feel that the, component, that the components of the car are dated. This, totally not. Now, what would I choose, this or a Mark II? It's, it's a very, very, it's a very, very difficult question. I think for pure driving experience, I'd have the Mark I. But for aesthetics, I think I would have the Mark II. So, you know, you, you've got to ask yourself, you know, are you in it for yourself or are you in it for other people? Because if you're in it for other people, the Mark II RS is there, you know, it stands out more, it's bigger, it's more aggressive, it's, it's a more known car of, its jet, of the year, so to say. But to impress yourself and to, for pleasant driving, it's got to be a Mark I. And just to extend that point where I was on about if you're in it for yourself or the people, Liam, the guy who owns this, he doesn't have Snapchat, he doesn't have Instagram, he's not care, he doesn't care about social media, uh, and he owns this. And I think that's, you know, it's a perfect representation of what these cars are about. They're about personal growth and personal fun and personal experience, rather than buying something just to impress other people. Uh, so that is the end of the video, lads. This car is fucking amazing. I love you all. Thanks, Liam, for lending it me and I'll see you next time. See you later Mr. RS.